So let me start from here, uh, which is uh, kind of a quick review of what we've covered last week, Lorentz transformation. And this is what Lorentz transformation says. It says that if you imagine two reference frames and one of the reference frames, the primed one, is moving relative to the other reference frame, which we'll say is at rest then given a particular position coordinate in space we can express that point either with this axis or this set of axes uh, with a reference to time and the Lorentz transformation that we learned the last week is the transformation rule that tells you given the coordinates reference to unprimed axis what are the coordinates in the primed axis? It says that x prime coordinate is given by x minus um, beta c t. This you might have guessed. Um, this uh, is what we were calling Galilean transformation. There's a modification here in that there's a gamma factor here where gamma is, oh wait, I should have defined beta first, where beta that I wrote here is defined as a v over c, that's a speed in unit of c, and gamma is given defined as one divided by square root of one minus beta squared. So position, the way the position coordinates transform, there's this uh, previously non-existent factor of gamma. The coordinates in the direction perpendicular to the direction of uh, motion of the frame, that's as expected, they don't change. And the, one of the things that were most uh, surprising is how the time coordinates transform. Before, it used to be that time was just the same. It didn't, didn't transform. There was an absolute time. And in special relativity, what we see is that uh, time transforms, goes as ct minus beta x, and there's this gamma factor. So this Lorentz transformation is what we've been covering through last week. And these, um, all these factors, that you are not used to seeing in um, previous our previous experience with the mechanics. Uh, in addition to the fact that it um, it's modifying your transformation laws, it, it it's paradigm shifting. Uh, it, because this uh, these formula laws they address the very underlying fabric of space and time. Um, the kind of the mechanical things, uh, laws of physics that we were talking about before then, um, they, they applied in the world where these highly highlighted bits didn't exist. Now that you have these highlighted bits, it, it changes the very underlying laws of nature. So, um, and this kind of modification, this is not really a, you know, first time you're saying something like this. I think uh, uh, a lot of people who took physics 4A will remember saying this, which is, so think back to when forces were introduced to you. We introduced uh, Newton's second law. And we said, okay, in Newton's second law, which describes the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And if you remember a little bit later in physics 4A, um, this actually turned out not to be correct. Uh, if you had a mass on object that was changing as the function of time, like in a rocket propulsion, then your textbook will um, point out eventually that in that scenario where mass is potentially changing, simple mass times acceleration no longer gives you the correct uh, value of force. 
What will give you the correct expression for force is the rate of change, time derivative of momentum. And you know, given that momentum is equal to mv, you can see that in the situations where mass is constant, then the time derivative of momentum, again, if the mass is constant, it's simply time mass times the time derivative of velocity. So, so you get this back. But, um, but you do need to watch out that if your mass is somehow time dependent, then these two expressions won't agree with each other. And the correct expression is the force described as the rate of change of momentum. So this was an example of a, a correction of a previously accepted formula that you have seen before. And I guess the difference um, between what you are now seeing with this example that you have seen before is that, um, well, you know, this only affects formula for the force. So once you have the force or the formula for the force, then you don't really have to worry about this distinction. The, with the special relativity, um, what's different is that it's a paradigm changing idea. Uh, basically, all of physics can be div divided into two pieces uh, around this division. There's the physics before special relativity or non-relativistic physics. There's physics after special relativity or relativistic physics. So everything that you had before in non-relativistic physics, uh, basically all the formulas you've had in non-relativistic physics, um, you have to question it. <laughs> it might, might not be correct. It probably very likely is incorrect. So you have to re-derive relativistically correct formulas. Uh, there are some exceptions because you basically know um, one set of laws that were already relativistically correct. Um, that one exception is the laws of electrodynamics or Maxwell's equations. These are relativistically correct. So for equations that you had, like an equation for the electromagnetic force or what's called the Lorentz force, uh, that's a given by this formula. Uh, so electromagnetic force is a charge times electric field plus V cross B. All this is relativistically correct and doesn't need to be modified. Not a single change is needed. But Aside from that, um, everything else you've learned, it's a non-relativistic low speed approximation and, um, and they now need to be corrected. Now, so, you know, you might ask, uh, so how do we, um, where do we start? How do we redrive these formulas? And uh, there are some principles you can lean on and um, in fact, I think I used this to redrive one of the formulas earlier. Um, you can rely on this, which is that general principles um, for which I can give examples like you have conservation of momentum, which you actually saw me use to redrive an expression for relativistic momentum or conser um, principles like a conservation of energy and a principle of relativity, I guess, and mathematical operations to the extent that they have nothing to do with the physical or, you know, to the sense that just talking about math, like taking derivative, doing integral. So <laughs> mathematical operations. All these um, uh, general principles uh, continue to hold. So just because we have to take relativity into account doesn't mean things like a conservation of momentum and conservation of energy has to be overhauled. They still remain and we can still use them. So now what we have to do is um, we have to take these general principles and modify the specific formulas so that those specific formulas 
will be consistent with the principle of relativity, mainly the Lorentz transformation. So that's all what we need to do. Um, let me just write that out. And that's all what we have done with momentum. Um, some time ago that you see in lectures, uh, I've used these as a guiding principles to redrive an expression for relativistically correct momentum. So pre-relativity, we had this. Mass times velocity gave you the momentum. Um, with relativity, we need this factor of gamma as a function of V, where reminder, gamma of V is one over square root of one minus V squared over C squared. So, so this is the relativistically correct formula for momentum, and um, and 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 you use this with conservation of momentum uh, principles, and everything will work fine now. Uh, now, if we are trying to use uh, conservation of momentum principles with the pre-relativistic momentum formula, then things will break down. But that's what these formulas are for. So. What I want to look at and correct in the remaining, I think, 10 minutes or so is the relativistically correct formula for kinetic energy. And in order to do that, what's useful is to um, examine the process that we used to before. So consider kinetic energy that we derived in uh, from physics 4A. I mean, we had this formula, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, but um, the formula doesn't really tell you what to do uh, if uh, you're trying to redrive it to be consistent with the uh, relativity. So what you have to do is think about, you know, where does this come from? Well, it came from what we call work kinetic energy theorem, or more specifically, um, we made this statement when you perform work on an object that amount of work you perform will give you a change of energy and if you set up the situation so that the only energy that can change is the kinetic energy then there's a change of kinetic energy okay um, and you know if you're in the work of kinetic energy theorem we say this is the network and uh, work is defined as the dot product of force times uh, displacement. And, you know, net force gives you network. That'll give you this. And I guess your textbook, the way um, OpenStax University Physics Volume 1 textbook does it, uh, they kind of assume this uh, form of kinetic energy and use that to prove this uh, work of kinetic energy theorem. But let me do it backward. Let me do it in a way where we are saying um, this is our beginning place. And um, we are going to define our kinetic energy to be consistent with this relationship, to be consistent with this kind of conservation of energy idea. So um, there are some laws of physics that we have to use. We need Newton's second law that says net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So we need, we use the Newton's second law. And uh, we used some things about kinematics that we knew. Uh, in this situation, if you're given the force, and you're given the displacement, then it's the kind of the situation where if you want to relay some quantity to velocity, you know the acceleration, displacement, and want to relate to velocity. Somehow time is not involved. Then it's the kind of situation where V squared formula is useful. V final squared is equal to V initial squared uh, plus a two times acceleration times the delta X. I guess technically this is a dot product. Uh, so if they're in opposite directions, it's negative. Um, yeah, yeah. So. So yeah, in this situation, if you set up the simple situation where your initial kinetic energy is zero, then what you had was from that, your final velocity, um, uh, let me solve for it in terms of this, final velocity squared divided by two is equal to acceleration 
that product with Delta X. And this is where you can kind of see the connection here. Um, imagine plugging in it here, then you get mass times acceleration, that product with the Delta X. Hey, I have that here. So I can substitute in V final squared over two. I get one over two times mass times V final squared. And if we say this is the expression for kinetic energy, then, then this relationship holds. And this is our non-relativistic derivation for kinetic energy. So to get the relativistic kinetic energy, basically the steps, what we need to do is we need to go through the same set of steps, um, minding, the, uh, minding the principles of relativity and carefully examining if each step of the way, um, uh, each step of the way holds. So let me start out by just uh, trying to calculate my network. So my network will say is force dot product with a delta x. And I guess looking at my previous derivation, hmm. so force is a quantity that um, I would eventually like to not deal with it directly. Um, so, so I, I'm imagining this picture here, you know, imagine a flat ground. I have some mass sitting here that I'm going to say I am pushing with some force F and this is starting at speed zero. And at some later time, I am going to have this mass that's moving with some final speed, some final state. So as I imagine doing that, um, uh, let me set it up this way. Uh, let me try to set it up so that my, uh, the rate of change of velocity, which will be changing from zero to some final value. Let's say this is what I'm trying to keep constant. So, which means I think I'm trying to say I'm going to try to keep the uh, trying to keep the acceleration constant. Yeah, constant acceleration. And in the previous situation, when you had a constant acceleration, you had a constant force, and that really gave a lot of nice situation setup. And what I will tell you is that. Um, we don't have that anymore because um, the first thing I will tell you is that this relationship that we had before, that's no longer going to hold. You can see here. So if I say force, now I'm going to be super careful and start out with my general expression for force, the rate of change of momentum. And before when momentum was, um, when momentum was mv, and I could say, oh, mass is constant, then I could just say, oh, time derivative velocity gives me acceleration, gives me that. I could do that. But now watch. I'm doing time derivative of gamma as a function of v times mv. Now, in this expression, I have two terms that are potentially a function of time. So V will be a function of time with this. And because gamma is a function of V as well, this is also a function of time. So when I take this derivative, uh, I'll need to use product rule. I have a product of two functions to apply derivative to one and then to the other. And whatever it ends up being, what I can say is that it's not going to be equal to gamma over v times m times the time derivative of um, the velocity. Like this is the one thing it's not going to be. So, so when I have constant acceleration, um, I'm no longer going to have constant force. So as I imagine pushing this block, I'll have a situation where my force will be changing. So that's the very first thing that um, we have to realize and uh, 
I think I'm gonna remember this. Uh, exp uh, you know, let me copy it over. So I'm gonna need that as I. Do. Um, so that. Uh, um, that's what we have to handle first. The the realization that our as we try to do this work at a constant acceleration, um, our force will no longer be constant. And you've seen you've seen me deal with the situations like this before. You know where so before uh, we would have said, okay, I have this displacement delta x. I'm applying this constant of force F, so I say work done is force times the total displacement. And when we can no longer do that, because our applied force will be a function of something else, so it won't be constant, then our approach, as you have seen before and as you will see now, is to take this uh, entire interval and divide it up into tiny little pieces and divide it up in such a way that we say, okay, I know how to handle this very small interval, small infinitesimal interval dx. And once I know how to handle that, I'll add it all back up. That'll give me the total change. So that's what we are going to start. We are going to start by saying, okay, I don't know this, know how to handle this entire quantity, but I can calculate infinitesimal amount of work done over an infinitesimal interval and the force at that infinitesimal interval will be the time derivative of the momentum that product with the dx so that will give me the infinitesimal amount of work done and i will integrate this from some initial condition to the final condition and that will give me the total amount of work done. And what I want to say is that we will say all this is going to equal uh, the change of kinetic energy from initial to final. So with that idea in head, let's uh, just uh, um, start substituting things in. So we have this expression for momentum, relativistic momentum. So we'll say, okay, my relativistic momentum is gamma mv. So let's say um, I'm going to be integrating from some initial condition to a final condition, uh, my time derivative of gamma. And let me make this one dimensional just so that I don't have to keep writing vector notation stuff. Gamma mv, we'll say, um, the direction of force, velocity, velocity change, and um, displacement, they are all in the same direction, dx. Okay, um, I probably should um, simplify this a little bit. The first bit of simplification is, you know, this gamma and v, uh, they actually are related to each other. You know, uh, gamma is given by one over square root of one minus v squared over c squared. Um, and you know, given this relationship, you can actually invert that. And when you invert it, let me just write it down. You can check my math later. V is equal to c times the square root of one minus one over gamma squared. So because both the gamma and v basically stand for one and the same thing, or they are two different ways to represent one quantity, uh, v. So I would like to shrink these two symbols down into one. Now, this is the step where a lot of people will uh, go kind of take the route that uh, turns out to be harder uh, because I think a lot of us feel like we have a more intuition dealing with the velocity than gamma. So a lot of uh, us will um, try to rewrite this thing in terms of V and work it through that way. And sorry, I can't select this. Um, and this is something that I learned working with the special relativity for a long time, that oftentimes um, the math is a lot easier when you uh, work with a gamma instead of V. So that's what I'm going to do. I am going to use this ex expression here to eliminate V and retain gamma. Let's see what we get when we do that. So I'm still integrating from some initial to final condition. Still do this time derivative of. 
And instead of gamma mv, it will be gamma m times all of this. C square root of 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. Now, you might feel like uh, that doesn't look any simpler, but watch. I have this factor of gamma here. I can absorb that into the square root. When I do that, what it amounts to is I take this, multiply that by gamma squared. So when I do that, the first term becomes gamma squared. Now the second term, it'll be gamma squared times 1 over gamma squared. So this just cancels out. So um, so this expression becomes, so I absorb that in, this expression here, it becomes mc square root of gamma squared minus 1. No fractions, just uh, some square roots that look a little bit um, uh, intimidating, but I, I think we can work through it. So, so yeah, uh, let's uh, see. Um, I feel like uh, this is about a good time to do this time derivative because I have everything in terms of just one variable. So I think it's going to be at least uh, a little bit manageable to do the derivative. So let's say it's still integral from some initial to final condition. Uh, MC are both constants, so not affected by the derivative. And so I should, when I take this derivative, I'm going to use the chain rule. So I need a derivative of outside. So, you know, it's a, this uh, outside is gamma squared minus one raised to power one half. You use the power rule. So this uh, factor of one half comes down times the derivative uh, or the, the power that it's raised to is reduced by one. So it will be gamma squared minus one raised to power of minus one half. That's the derivative of outside derivative of the inside is going to be uh, 2 gamma. And oh, and gamma is, uh, I'm doing derivative with respect to time, and gamma should still be a function of time. So I still need the derivative of the inside, derivative of gamma, that will be derivative of gamma with respect to time. OK, I think I'm done with the time derivative, and I still have this dx. And um, I can do some simplifications, you know, this two cancels that out. And, you know, it can still kind of looks intimidating. And there's a, still a bit of a calculus left. And uh, I will say in the interest of time, I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut. Um, so, you know, so far this uh, derivative is with respect to, sorry, this integral either with respect to x. And I happen to know that I would rather have integral with respect to gamma. And I'm pretty sure there's a proper way to do this, either with a u substitution or with, uh, I don't know, integration by parts or whatever. Um, I'm going to engage in a bit of a, a abuse of notation because what we have is d gamma over dt times dx. And, you know, this kind of looks like a fraction. So if this is the denominator, I can say, oh, dx over dt, and not have dt here, d gamma times dx over dt. And the reason I do like this is I can identify this as a v. So with that a bit of an abuse of notation, I can say all of this is a v. Therefore, using this, c times square root of 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. Now, I'm calling this abuse of notation uh, because it is. Uh, it, I'm doing something improper. Uh, please don't do this in your calculus class. Um, now, I happen to know this gives me the correct answer. And as long as I do this carefully, it doesn't <laughs> result in a serious error. So let me do that and wrap up this derivation. So um, now this is the part where you have to be careful. I've deliberately kept limits of integration vague. I've been saying, oh, integral from some initial to final condition. And that's because I kind of want you to do this from the start. So I want you to say, oh, I'm really talking about my gamma as some gamma initial value and my 
uh, final value, gamma final, it's a gamma final value. Uh, <laughs> and that will actually um, fix, uh, I think, uh, you, you know, so being careful with the limits of integration is what will kind of cover over whatever wrong thing I was introducing with this abuse of notation. So let me um, finish this up. There was a reason I did that, um, uh, committed a mathematical sin, because it really leads to a beautiful simplification. I have mass times a C times, let me just write this out, that's um, gamma divided by square root of gamma squared minus one. And, um, and uh, let me write out that V uh, in terms of that. So it'll be C times square root of one minus one over gamma squared. And I still have that D gamma. And this is the beautiful simplification. Look at this expression here. And this expression here, I can simplify it by multiplying top and bottom by one over gamma. Now you might think that's not simplification at all. I mean, the numerator becomes one, but the denominator, this is where you will see, absorbing this one over gamma in, gamma squared becomes one, minus this becomes one over gamma squared, and square root of that, that is the same thing as that. So these two cancel out. That's the simplification. Once you've done that, what's remaining are, let me factor out the constant factors. I have mc, so mc squared, let me write out the integral of, uh, oh, this is the sole integrand, d gamma. So what used to be a very intimidating and challenging integral in terms of gamma, it, it, that's not an integral at all. That's just, uh, I mean, you know, it's one. And to derivative one would be gamma. So that gives you this a simple answer that the result of this integration is gamma um, evaluated from gamma initial to gamma final, or um, it's a gamma final minus gamma initial. Now, this is where you do have to be a little bit careful. So gamma final, we can say, oh, that's my whatever gamma I end up with. That's my final gamma. Your gamma initial, if you are starting from rest, if you are starting from where the block wasn't moving at all, that V equals zero, that corresponds to gamma equal to one, according to this formula. So your initial gamma will be one. So that's our result. The relativistically correct formula for kinetic energy that comes from this amount of work being done is equal to, um, there's gamma mc squared minus mc squared. And the derivation up above is the derivation for getting here. Now, once you have this result, I hope you will see that um, that looks unnecessarily complicated, especially in that you have this minus mc squared term. You know, before, um, when you're looking at non-relativistic kinetic energy, you had one half mv squared. And, you know, looking at it, you wouldn't think like, that looks like one thing. And like, and you wouldn't go out looking for something that's either missing from it or you, like there, you wouldn't be trying to interpret what the expression means. When you look at, this expression, uh, that's where you say, hmm, um, that looks overly complicated, as in you have this gamma mc squared, which, you know, it seems decent, and especially if you compare it to expressions like relativistic momentum of gamma mv, there's a kind of nice symmetry there. They both have one factor of gamma. Looks great. But What's this nonsense? Why are you subtracting off uh, mc squared? And um, and someone with the right kind of imagination 
might imagine that um, this uh, point uh, hints at a true nature of kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is not itself uh, one thing, but it's uh, two things. Uh, in that, this uh, let's just give it a name: total energy. This might be one of the two things that kinetic energy is composed of. And the other thing is, you know, in order to get kinetic energy, um, an object has some total energy that it has, even when you have speed of zero. So this is what you might call rest energy. And what we call kinetic energy is the combination of this total energy and rest energy, mainly um, rest energy subtracted away from the total energy so that at V equals zero, you will have zero kinetic energy. That's what uh, this expression might suggest. And, uh, and this is the correct interpretation. I have a slightly longer lecture that does go over that. But, um, but this is the relativistic expression for kinetic energy. And uh, there's, um, and, uh, and we use this as a starting point to, to get to the idea of total energy. And there's more um, interesting underlying mathematical structure to special relativity that you will see in other lectures. So.